Okay, so welcome to the, uh, the class on thermodynamics of materials. And as you know, thermodynamics of materials is a study of how heat and various forms of work relate to the physical properties of materials. By physical properties of materials, we mean something like energy, entropy, heat capacity, um, thermal expansion, etc. So I will come to all these physical properties and how heat and work relates to them. Because as you know, um, uh, when we talk about thermodynamics, uh, when we talk about thermodynamic processes, we always think of heat flow or heat transfer, we think of mechanical work, we think of various forms of work like mechanical, uh, electrical or uh, electrical work is possible, mechanical work is possible, chemical work is possible, but basically there is a chemical reaction happening, so that gives rise to what is called a chemical work. So, or some phase transformation or phase change is happening, all of these comes into the purview of thermodynamics of materials. However, this lecture series, so initially we will talk about equilibrium thermodynamics, which is basically when I talk about equilibrium, that means this rate independent, it does not depend on rate or time, right? So it has nothing to do with time, right? It basically tells whether some reactions are feasible, whether a phase change is possible, and stuff. Right? It talks about equilibrium. Now, equilibrium, what type of equilibrium it, the, the, does it talk about? Uh, say, for example, thermal equilibrium when two bodies or a body itself is in thermal equilibrium or is it in mechanical equilibrium. That means some of forces is equal to zero. Thermal equilibrium means basically there is no heat flow and then uh, in the body means from one part of the body to another there is no heat flow. So and then if a body is in thermal equilibrium and uh, means basically it is at the same temperature everywhere and then there is also chemical equilibrium. Where we will invoke or define something called chemical potential and we will tell that chemical potential again the chemical potentials are to be the same for, for all species across uh, uh, different phases. So I will come to all of this uh, one by one. So first before we go there we will tell that often I will use something called a body of matter and this body of matter I will refer to uh, which is of the focus of our study and that body of matter that is the focus of our study I will call it system. So I will call it system. So, system is the body of matter that is the focus of our study. So, right? So, this is basically I am focusing on uh, some portion of uh, matter, and in that portion of matter, we are looking at uh, different thermodynamic processes. And uh, as a response to these thermodynamic processes, how the, 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 the condition of the system will change, and also when the condition of the system changes as a result of thermodynamic processes in it, the system also influences everything else and that is the surrounding and surrounding basically means everything else excluding the system which is our focus, right? System is our focus but everything else excluding the system that feels or that is influenced by changes happening in the system. So, if there are some changes happening in the system and that affects uh, the, uh, that affects the surroundings. So, so basically, it's like a region of influence of for the system. So, in, in the system, something is going on. So, that system is our um, uh, focus of study, right? So, we are studying the system, and we are also seeing if there is anything happening in the system, does it influence the surroundings? So, and surroundings is that region which gets influenced by the system. So, as a result. When I talk about universe in thermodynamics, so universe basically means system and surrounding. So, system and surroundings together basically make the universe. 
Now, when we talk about universe, we talk of properties, some properties of the universe. And these properties of the universe define the thermodynamic laws. For example, as you know, that there is something called first law. First law is nothing but a principle of conservation of energy. So, so energy is a property of the universe. So, there exists a property of the universe called energy that remains conserved regardless of the processes that takes place within the universe. Right? So, regardless of the processes that take place within the universe. Another thing I wanted to, I forgot to mention that between the system surroundings a wall or a boundary and this is very important, I will come back to that and I will come back to the properties of the boundary and this boundary or wall is something that defines the condition within the system as well as the condition of the surroundings. So, it is a boundary that separates the system from the surroundings and across the boundary you can have energy transfer, different types of energy transfer like heat transfer of mechanical work transfer or chemical work transfer and so on. So now, as I told you, first I defined energy as a property of the universe that remains conserved or constant regardless of the processes that take place within the system or within the, within the universe. Again, there exists another property of the universe which is called entropy that is the second law that always changes in the same direction regardless of the processes that take place. Basically, entropy sets directionality of a thermodynamic process. So, it basically tells you uh, that entropy decides uh, whether a process uh, will move in one direction or the other. Right? So, basically it gives the directionality of the system, uh, directionality of a process and it really does not, um, um, it really does not uh, have any conservation in it. So, there is no conservation associated with entropy, but entropy gives you the directionality, right? It gives you, means whether a process will be spontaneous or not. So, this is what entropy defines and this entropy again is a property of the universe that always changes in the same direction, means either it increases or decreases regardless of the processes that take place. The entropy of the universe in general always increases and this is what we will see and we will see that if the entropy of the universe increases that is again a restatement of uh, equilibrium. Right? And then uh, the final uh, law that is the third law it tells about an absolute scale of temperature or and in that absolute scale there is a lower limit and this lower limit is called absolute zero of temperature. This absolute zero of temperature is where all substances have the same entropy. In other words, all substances cease to have any entropy. So, entropy vanishes at the lower limit at the absolute at the absolute zero of temperature. So, basically all substances we can also tell that all substances have the same entropy at this absolute zero of temperature. Now, what is energy? In general, as we know, like uh, from our uh, uh, from the physics that we have learned before, that it is the capacity or ability of a physical system to do what, right? And the different categories of energy, two categories we are already familiar. One is potential energy. Potential energy is associated with the position or configuration of a body in a potential field. For example, if I think of a pebble and I hold it at a distance h above our surface and this pebble is placed in the earth's gravitational potential field, then this pebble experiences an acceleration um, uh, due to gravity and um, this acceleration due to gravity is g and if the mass of the pebble is m, then the potential energy E p will be equal to m g h. Now, let us assume that uh, this uh, I have taken this pebble and this pebble I have thrown and it has acquired some velocity. Then, once it has velocity, it has momentum as a result, it has kinetic energy and the kinetic energy of this pebble will be, the pebble is moving in certain direction with some velocity v, then in the three dimensional space basically in the in the in three dimensions right, we, we are three dimensional. So, we can write that E k will be half m v 
x square plus half m v y square plus half m z square right where vx vy vz are the x y and z components of velocity v in a uh, reference frame right in a given reference frame uh, uh, Cartesian reference frame and then there is another category of energy which is called internal energy this internal energy of a body or a system is the energy that is associated with the internal condition see there are this internal condition or state of a body or a system and it does not depend on its motion or position in space. Say for example, I take a body and the body has a potential energy, the body has a kinetic energy, the body also has an internal energy. This is, this internal energy is the energy associated with the internal condition of the body. It does not depend on any external condition of the body. It means basically whether it is placed in a, a potential field or whether it is moving with certain velocity, the macroscopic body has an internal energy. This internal energy's origin is basically microscopic because the body of matter or all matter is composed of atoms, right? Atoms or molecules, right? these are the building blocks of matter. So these atoms or molecules are often in microscopic motion, right? They are in microscopic motion and they are also interacting with the other uh, atoms, right? All these atoms that are there, it's like an assembly of atoms, which is uh, the body cons uh, has uh, which constitutes uh, comprises of a lot of atoms and mm, these atoms are interacting with each other and these atoms are also moving right they are in they are, they are, there may be translational motion there may be rotational motion there may be uh, vibrational motion right vibrational kinetic of energy and all of these all of this microscopic motion and this microscopic interactions basically result in the internal state or condition or the internal energy of the body. So basically, you have a body or a system, right? Body is comprised of atoms, these tiny particles called atoms or the building blocks called atoms and these atoms are moving and then they are interacting, right? And all of these like interactions and um, uh, forming bonds for example this is one uh, like different types of bonds are formed and that means they are interacting there is some force between them of these atoms and then they are also moving right they can move uh, there can be translational motion there can be rotational motion of these at uh, these atoms and there can also be vibrational motion see all of these put together is giving you the internal energy of the body So that's the end. So here we have written, say for example, here we can, uh, as you can see here, that we are showing the body, and this body is composed of molecules or atoms, and the internal energy, which is macroscopic, right? So it is macroscopic, but it's a, this is a microscopic thermodynamic property, right? It's a macroscopic thermodynamic property. But this is an outcome of all these microscopic interactions and microscopic motion, like kinetic energy of molecules that comprise that, that comprise the body and potential energy of molecules or atoms that comprise the body. So this gives you the total internal energy of the system, the body. Now, one very important thing that I have to tell you that this total internal energy which is a property of the body, right, which, which tells you the internal, the, the internal state or internal condition of the body is an extensive property. That is, its value, it, it depends on, the energy depends on the extent or size of the system. For example, let us consider this small system that we have with the volume V and internal energy U. Now, I say increase the extent or size of the system by 2V, right, I increase it by two times, so the volume has increased two times, then the internal energy also increases by a factor of two. So it depends on the extent or size of the system. So if I have, say for example, one system, 
say let's call it system one and I have another system two and I have u1 is the internal energy of system one and this is u2 then basically if I combine these two systems and make a big system say so call it system three which is one plus two there the internal energy will be u1 plus u2 similarly the total volume is an extensive property. For example, if system 1 has a volume of V1 and system 2 has a volume of V2, then the total volume when I combine these two systems is V1 plus V2. Right? So, so these are extensive properties, extensive, these are extensive thermodynamic properties and uh, similarly, if I think of like you have, uh, say I think of a unary system, a unary system means a system containing one chemical species only. One chemical species. It can be a compound, it can be a an element, it can be a gas, it can be a solid, it can be a liquid. So, uh, one chemical species, right. So, for example, say water. Okay, so here I have say N1, so these are two systems, each contain water and I have N1, here I have N1 moles of H2O, means water molecules and here um, I have N2 moles of H2O and I combine them together to form the system 3 and here the number of water molecules will be just additive, right. So here for N3, which is the number of water molecules of the system 3, it will be just N1 plus, right. So, the total internal energy, the total vo the volume uh, as a whole and mole number, mole number is the number of moles of a particular species, these are all extensive quantities, remember. The, what is an intensive property? Intensive property means it is opposite of extensive, that means it does not depend on the extent of the system. It does not depend on the extent of the system. For example, U bar that we have used here, this U bar is basically U by N, right? N is basically the, say for example, N is the number of moles, and N is the number of moles of a species uh, and uh, um, so basically I have a system, let us consider a system whose internal energy was u and it contained n moles of species. Now, if I tell u bar, u bar is basically a specific internal energy. Specific internal energy means it is internal energy per mole of the species, right. So, it has n moles of certain species of some species and what we are telling is u bar is u by n which is a specific internal energy or molar internal energy. Similarly, I can basically give another example. Say for example, I have some W is the mass, W is the total mass of matter in a system, let us call it A. In system A, W is the total mass contained in system A, right. So, so W is the mass. Right, uh, and say U with the total internal energy.
then u by w again let's call it u bar is basically energy per unit mass which is again a specific quantity a specific quantity right it's 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 a specific because it is per unit mass right it's like uh, per kg or per gram right energy per gram energy per kg energy per mole these are all specific quantities now when we have specific quantities these are intensive quantities why is that so let us think of this so i have say again i will take the same example of a unitary system and i will tell i have system 1 which had uh energy of u1 and it had in one moles of a component of a chemical species so in uh, one moles of a chemical species say for example say um, n1 moles of uh, uh, aluminum and then i have another system which is system 2 which are an internal energy of 2 and contain n2 moles of aluminum so you have now u1 and n1 i am telling for system 1 if i define the specific internal energy or internal energy per mole or molar internal energy so molar internal energy Yes, u one bar, which is basically u one by n one. Now for system two, molar internal energy u two bar is. u2 by n2 right so you have u1 bar and u2 bar now let's go to the next page so i'll just open another page so basically you had two systems system 1 and system 2 so i had so let's write a table here so we had two systems one is this one and this is two and we had Energy one and the energy two and uh, number of moles and this cis one is also containing aluminium atoms and cis two also contains aluminium atoms so it is n one moles of aluminium and here is n two moles of aluminium so basically I can define a u one bar which is molar internal energy of system 1 which is basically u1 by n1 and u2 bar which is u2 by n2. now i am creating a system 3 by adding c1 in system 1 plus c2 so here U three will be nothing but U one plus additive, right? Extensive property. Similarly, N three will be N one plus two. Now, U three bar, which is the molar internal energy, will be equals to 
u3 by n3. Now let us look at this. Now can we tell that u3 bar equals to u1 bar plus u2 bar? Let's find out. Okay. Now u1 bar is basically u1 by n1 and this is u2 by n2. U2 bar. So, but U3 bar is basically U3 by N3, which is basically means if I tell this, then this implies this, right? If I tell that this equation is valid, then this equation is also valid. Now, if you see, or what does it imply? What is valid now? That U1 plus U2 by n1 plus n2 is equals to u1 by n1 plus u2 by n2 which is definitely wrong mathematically right it is definitely wrong right so basically the specific quantities thus are intensive quantities that is they are not additive so u3 bar is not equal to this or because this is not equal and this is also not equal right since u1 plus u2 since u1 plus u2 by n1 plus n2 is no way is not equal to u1 by n1 plus u2 by n2 then if evidently u bar which is basically molar internal energy or you can also call it like uh, you can also define u bar as internal energy per unit mass so whatever it is, it is per mole or per mass, it does not matter, is molar quantities or per unit mass quantities or specific quantities are intensive. It is an intensive property because it is not additive. Intensive. Okay, so I'll come back to this intensive properties uh, more, uh, but let us look at another very interesting property of energy or internal energy. Now, when we look at uh, in thermodynamics, when thermo in thermodynamics of materials or in the study of thermodynamics, we generally do not care about the absolute value of energy. We do not care about okay, uh, what is the absolute value of energy in this condition or in certain other condition and stuff. We are more interested in basically the relative the change in energy right from one state to the other state so i had say for example uh, a, a system say let's call it say, this one which had an initial internal means the, in, the, the internal energy before any thermodynamic processes happen was ui now I take the same system in you work with this S1 is subject to some processes, right? Some processes like heat transfer, some mechanical work being done, and all this stuff. And now I have the same new one, uh, same system S1, but the internal energy has changed to UF. Now, if you see whatever be the thermodynamic processes that has happened ui has changed to uf now what we are basically interested in is understanding this delta u or change in internal energy when i go from one state which is say for example ui is the initial state so this is the say the initial state and this is the final state so we are interested in the difference in energy uh, when I go from say initial state to a final state. So basically I have a reference state with respect to the reference state how much of the energy has changed if some thermodynamic processes have acted upon the system. This is what we are interested in. Right? So in such now you see one very interesting thing. I will write that u is a state function. Energy is a state function. That is it depends only on the state of the system right so delta u depends on the final state and the initial state right 
it does not depend on what type of path these processes have taken uh, to go from ui means i to f so basically you have gone from initial which is basically i that you have gone to final which is f now whether your process went this way whether your process was like this or whether your process was just like a uh, means means what type of processes have happened like heat transfer has happened um, say some 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 mechanical work has been done or mechanical work has been done by the system itself or it has been done on the system so the processes can take various paths for example it has taken various paths and it has finally reached like this type of a path it has finally reached in another case one process was there so it is like sum of three processes and in another case there was only one single process by which you have gone from ui to here in another case you have gone through some other route say for example you have gone like this so you went like this and then you went like this irrespective of whatever processes whatever paths this process have taken the delta u that is a change in internal energy depends only on the final state and the initial state so the internal energy in the final state minus the internal energy in the initial state basically gives me the change in internal energy therefore u is a state function so basically a process a thermodynamic process that involves heat and work transfer can change the system from i to f along several possible paths for example i'll give some few possible paths here in this pv diagram so i have uh, p in the y axis or pressure in the y axis and volume in the um x axis and let us assume that uh, uh we are talking about internal energy of a gas and uh, uh, right of a uh, of a system that contains a gas and i am telling that i am going from i to f across three different paths say for example the first path is from i start with i i go to a which is basically we are telling the See, as you can see, this is volume axis. This is the volume axis, and this is the pressure axis. Now, along volume axis, if I go from I to A, this means my volume is constant, but my pressure is dropping from P two to P one, right? My pressure has dropped from P two to P one, but my volume remains fixed. So, these processes where volume iso volume means the volume is changed is called an iso iso pouring process. right it's uh, iso volume process it's called i think it's called as pouring process and then um, if uh, i am telling wrong then you can uh, uh, find out what it is and then uh, and let me know and then from a to f so i am gone from i to a which is an iso, uh, iso volume so i have maintained the volume to the same i have only that there is a pressure drop right in during this process there is a pressure drop from p2 to p1 and But the volume remains the same. Now you go from A to F, where basically the volume has increased from V1 to V2. When you go from A to F, but you have kept the pressure at P1. So you have held the pressure at P1, and the volume has expanded from V1 to V2. And you have now gone finally from I to A to F. There is another process. For example, say you go from I to B. Okay, where basically the volume has increased from V1 to V2, and and this again an isobaric process because the pressure is maintained at P2, and from B you have gone to F. Again, this is iso volume or isobaric process where there is pressure drop from P2 to P2. So this is another possible path that you can think of. There are infinite number of possible paths, but I am just talking about some three possible paths. so basically i think of another possible path which is slightly curved path where basically along this curved path we are maintaining so along the curved path that is i e f i to e to f or i e f we are maintaining that pressure to the product of pressure and volume so along i to e to f we are maintaining for example the p times v equal to constant now if i assume the curve the gas to be ideal so pv as you know equals to nrt and i am telling n is constant say r is universal gas constant and and telling the temperature is constant then pv is constant basically it denotes an isothermal process so ief is an isothermal process 
by by which you have gone from i to f now you see there are three processes or three possible paths by means that i have shown here there may be more possible paths like you can have an adiabatic process you can have many many different processes or the different pathways through which you can go from like infinite uh, path pathways through which you can go from the state i to state f however the delta u does not depend on whatever paths or whatever process uh, whatever was the, what was the sequence of processes or whatever whatever path has been taken it depends on uf and uy so basically it depends on the value of u here and the value of u here that's all so it depends on that and if it knows uf and uy it just takes uf minus uy and it gives you delta u. so it does not does not depend on the path taken right it does not depend on the path so we can call that u as a result is a state function right it depends only on the state of the system it only depends on the internal state of the system it does not really depend on that for example it depends on the initial and final states but does not depend on the path that the system takes and therefore it's called a state function so delta u equals to uf minus u now as i told delta u equal to uf minus u i which is basically like a macroscopic change in thermal energy we can also think of an infinitesimal change say for example there is an infinitesimal change du right here we have written there is an infinitesimal change du and now i am integrating du from the initial state to the final state what i get is uf minus ui